nation in the world because the gap between what we know about care for the retarded and what is actually being done is increasing at a rapid rate. Three out of every 100 Americans are mentally retarded, that's six million people, and it is estimated that another four million will be born before the turn of the century. More than 200,000 live in public institutions. The retarded have committed no crime, but the stigma of being less than perfect often sentences them to live in conditions worse than those in many prisons. That is the subject of tonight's report, a study of what the state of Maryland provides the mentally retarded. Segments of the program were shown earlier this month on News 4 Washington. Much of what will be shown is ugly and shocking. Some of you may not wish to see it. The story actually began with the recent birth of a mongoloid baby at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. The parents refused to permit doctors to remove an obstruction from the infant's stomach and permitted the baby to starve to death. Perhaps they simply could not tolerate a life with a baby which was less than what society has determined is normal. It was an agonizing time for the parents and the pediatrician, Dr. Robert Cook, head of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. He discussed his feelings with reporter Claire Crawford, who then went to Rosewood State Hospital for the retarded to see what alternatives exist for parents who cannot afford private care for retarded children. First, Dr. Cook. I think the birth of a handicapped child such as a mongoloid infant is really a terribly difficult uh, experience for any family to uh, accept. Uh, there are stigmas still in our society to having a handicapped child. Uh, there are great expectations that people have for their children and when one is abnormal this is a great disappointment. And I think a mother right after the birth of a child is frequently not in a very good position to make a decision in a very rational way. So I can be sympathetic to such a family, even though I wouldn't agree with what was done. What would parents' alternative besides letting it die? Well, if the parents gave up the child and the state assumed custody, then the state would place that baby in some kind of a foster home if there was any available and uh, or in an institution which I think is the uh, alternative that many parents would think of and they might think that it'd be better if the baby died than go into a terrible institution these people are inmates not patients they have been placed here by their parents or the state. They have done nothing. They just have IQs of less than 70. That's what can happen to people like them in Maryland. 104 of them live in this building, which can cost their parents up to $16 a day. It's called King Cottage. The day I was there, the wash bowls had not been used. The dust was clearly visible. It was obvious that they had not been used for some time. An attendant said there was a broken pipe, but the mop sink worked. The attendants say the inmates were bathed the night before, and every night for that matter. But the inmates did not smell or look as if they were bathed often. So no one really cared that there was no bathing that day, or that no one's teeth were brushed. Many inmates have obvious dental problems or have no teeth at all. An attendant says it's cute to watch the toothless ones pretend to brush. takes about two hours, from six to eight. There are 104 sleeping here, only about 17 more than the hospital officials say ideally should be here. But it is obvious that there is not enough staff or space to handle that many. 
So by any logical standard, the cottage is vastly overcrowded. Rosewood used to be called the Maryland Asylum for the Feeble-Minded. The first cottage was built in 1888, and the way it's run hasn't changed much. Doctors are in charge, in charge of everything. There are 25 medical doctors here, and they are so busy deciding when to order new furniture or fix the plumbing, they don't have time to help the 2,500 inmates get better and return to the community. The inmates are supposed to have IQs of less than 70. Some have higher. Maryland Health Secretary Neil Solomon says a tremendous number of them should be back in the community. Every door is locked at King. The inmates are penned up in a smelly basement room with nothing to do most of the time. The new state mental retardation director, Bert Schmickel, says Many of the inmates are mentally sick and need help, but there is no psychiatric help at Rosewood. Mostly the inmates are left alone. Some chew on mop strings, some carry out fantasies, and exhibit symptoms of mental disorders. There's supposed to be an hour of recreation in the morning and afternoon. At that time, the staff says, the inmates are given games, toys, and equipment. That's kept locked up at all other times because the inmates will break it up as children do break toys. The three days I visited King, I never saw the recreation period. Fourteen of the 104 King inmates are supposed to go to the modern Rosewood school for two and one-half hours each day when a teacher comes to get them. I never saw the teacher. The attendants are just custodians. When they manage to get outside, they enjoy it. This day, the recreation aide, who serves another cottage besides King, insisted on taking the patients out. The staff felt the ground was too damp. Most attendants find it easier to control the inmates in a locked, empty room. Oh, 
The main meal is served around noon in the basement. It is not called lunch or dinner, but feeding time. Recently, the food cost 85 cents a day, but Solomon, on his own, increased it to 99 and one-half cents. The legislature objected, saying he didn't have the authority, and he didn't. However, the higher rate is still being paid. No matter, the food still smells like the room. It has the same bad kennel stench which stifles the upstairs. I was there for three noon meals. During an arranged visit, the room was spotless. When I came unannounced, the room was dirty. And attendants kept the inmates waiting while the place was swept, presumably for the cameras. When the inmates eat, the scene cannot be adequately described. It must be watched to be believed. After lunch, they go to the recreation room or the dormitory, which one afternoon remains battered with human waste. It's not clear who is supposed to clean up such mess. They use drugs at Rosewood. About 2,000 of the inmates take everything from aspirin to antibiotics every day. And about 1,000 are tranquilized. It's given to the hyperactive inmates to calm them down make them more manageable. They like the drug, take them willingly, almost as if it were food. The barbed wire at Rosewood seals off the maximum security ward, which is called the Zell. It is named for a long-dead Baltimore coal merchant. Fifty of the 56 inmates here are tranquilized. They are kept here because they cause some trouble at another cottage or try to run away. The less retarded are toilet trains and usually spend their days in the basement where it smells. The reason is that the toilets at the end of a basketball court are stopped up. And because they are broken, no one uses the court. It is empty. The toilets are scooped out, but even then there is a smell, so the court is not used. One Bazell staffer said the toilets have been broken for six years. But Rosewood clinical director Kurt Glazer said that is not true, that they have been broken for only three years. Immediately after I visited Bazell with television cameras and called a hole in the roof to Dr. Glazer's attention, it was partially fixed. Rain for some years came through the hole and down all three floors of the cell. There are orders to 
to improve things at the Zell, but so far you can't see any change. There is no program. A recreation aide is supposed to be on duty from 7 to 3, but I never saw one. Attendants say there is no equipment because the inmates break it. And officials admit that some of the less retarded may not even belong at Rosewood. Two inmates in particular did not have any symptoms of the others. But most of the people obviously need help. King and Bissell are not the entirety of Rosewood. The hospital actually mirrors society at large. There are sections of the institution where the treatment is reasonable and the retarded are being trained. But as you have seen, at King and Vassell, Rosewood does have its dumping grounds. At other sections, the retarded are being trained because they have learned the Rosewood system, obey the rules, a system that's hard to understand for a person with a low IQ. There is Linda, a 21-year-old cripple with cerebral palsy. Rosewood is her story. She spent most of her life here and perhaps has received the best and briefly the worst the institution offers. Though she is smarter than most Rosewood inmates, officials haven't been able to find her a home outside. She was seven when she lived in ancient Pembroke Cottage, built in 1892 and Rosewood's oldest building. It was a terrible place. It was messy, sloppy, and smelling thing and everything. And food wasn't right. When I couldn't make it across the road down to the... Uh, Oh, what you call it? Cafeteria. Um, they used to bring my food in a plate, plate, uh, paper plate, and it was cold and kind of mixed, and it didn't taste right. And uh, half the time it wasn't, you know, cooked right. I could find, like, maybe a piece of eggshell and eggshell, and maybe the potatoes wouldn't cook right or something like that. But uh, and then when you used to... You and they used to dress us. You had dresses on the shelf on the wooden, and they used to, you know, give you give you anything, mostly to wear. And I had a hard time finding clothes for kids because there's a whole lot of patients in Primbrook that was pretty hard to get clothes for. So you mean that you had dresses that were your own that your family had given you? Yes, you still had to wear those yes, fat. right. But we had we had to still wear wear their clothes. The clothes they gave us, like we could, we could wear our own personal clothes all the time, because they maybe they, they had them locked up or something. Yeah, they had them locked up. It hasn't changed much. Linda said it was crowded then, and it's crowded now. There are 76 women and children living in the Fieldstone Cottage, which really is too small for even Rosewood's ideal capacity. Officials say there should be 61. There's usually only music or games during an hour's recreation scheduled twice a day. Mostly the inmates sit or stroll around the recreation room. They range from 8 to 67 years old. And the staff calls them the girls. 29 take tranquilizers. And there's generally the same dull, purposeless indoor activity of all the old buildings on the Rosewood Quadrangle. It is here in the Quadrangle that 758 people, who just happen to have low intelligence, are locked up. That's a third of Rosewood's inmates. Only 49 of the younger quad inmates are in a program that might help them to live outside the institution. The rest simply exist. Rosewood officials admit quad residents live badly, and there's too little space, staff, or activity. But they say it's better than it used to be. State Mental Retardation Director Bert Schmickel says he doesn't doubt the quad as a dumping place for uncooperative inmates, and it is used as a threat to keep other inmates in line. He plans to change this. As Linda recall, Quad and Pembroke residents can't even wear their own clothes most of the time. It's the next shapeless sack on the state dress shelf, small, medium, or large. Linda, look this way. Don't look at the camera. 
For some reason, 32 lucky Pembroke residents usually attend classes like these for one hour weekdays. Another 42 quad residents also are in similar classes. may be the most tragic inmates and perhaps the only patients at Rosewood, the bedridden. They will always be in an institution. And besides their obvious and appalling physical infirmities, a number of them are not mentally retarded. But they have the same program as the retarded patients in this overcrowded ward. This program is not official, but appears to be the efforts of the staff. Schmickel praises them, but he wants more. He says even a very retarded bedridden patient should have music to enjoy or be moved from bed to mat every day. He thinks this type of patient should be intellectually stimulated. was built in 1942. It marked the beginning of what one Rosewood staffer called the Brick Age. The furnishings are more modern, and it's not as crowded. Only 15 of the 49 inmates are tranquilized. The statistics at Rosewood, which vary from day to day and official to official, say that Wyatt girls have higher IQs. But more important, these girls are here because they've learned to conform to the Rosewood system, which is not to be a burden to the staff. And it has paid off. They are treated like individuals unlike the inmates in the quadrangle. Most of the girls at Wyatt wear their own clothes or school uniforms. They walk around by themselves or with others if they want to. They're not forced to go in groups accompanied by an attendant. They even go to school just across the street. It's the only one on the grounds. It looks like most suburban elementaries, and the kids are there from 9 to 3. There you are. <laughs> I'm glad I found you. Maybe you can help me. Hey, Carter. Are you happy to be with him? Hey, Carter. What's the trouble? Well, I was walking down Sesame Street, and I saw a great big long word written on the stocky board. Mm -hmm. I know it's an A word because it begins with the letter A. But it's such a big word, I can't read it. Boy, that's that beautiful. That's the best word. Word. That's the best word. That's the best word. generally regarded as successful, although it doesn't reach all the inmates on the campus. The key is individual attention and small classes. In fact, compared to the rest of Rosewood, the school seems empty. In addition to the regular members of the staff, there are volunteer aides who come in from the outside community. The lessons are practical, how to get along with classmates, how to pay attention, how to count money. Okay. That'll make this nine a what? A what? I'm scared of this thing. It's not going to hurt you. Okay, look. You had your one up here. Look at me. You had your one up here again, but you didn't carry it. You didn't. You carried it, but you didn't add it. 
About 500 of Rosewood's residents are in full-day educational programs like these. They are the ones with the only real chance to leave Rosewood and make it in the world outside. The school has many of the advantages of a wealthy one. A stage, an orchestra pit, a gymnasium, a swimming pool, and a music teacher with two degrees who comes up with special arrangements for the school band. One, two, three, four. Health Secretary Neil Solomon has closed admissions at Rosewood to try to stop more overcrowding. And he's moved some of the inmates to Mount Wilson, a tuberculosis hospital about two miles from Rosewood. Most of the advanced young inmates, including Linda, live there, and they like it. How do you spend your days now? What are you doing? Well, I work down in uh, Holland College, shelter workshop. Uh, I work on the Black & Decker when we have it, and lab tubes with uh, TV and two other cards. Preparing stuff for Yeah, for lab. But, uh, it's for the health, of, the health department. And what else do you do? Um, toys. Putting them on cards. Uh, fours, that's 32 all together. Make sure none of them are, you know, broken. And I work on grab bags. What are grab bags? Grab bags are for little boys and girls who like to, you know, go in the store and they see a bag. And... They grab it. It only costs ten cents. You put three three toys or four. It depends what the to uh, what the, uh, how the shape the toys into. Now, if it's two good toys, you're only supposed to put two and a little rabbit that walks down the board. And is that how you do it? Yes, that's how I do it. And uh, another girl staples it on a card. You put twelve on a card. You just staple the toys on the card. Yeah, you staple the bag. The toys are in the bag. I fold the bag. And they're ready to go. It's wonderful. You have more activities, and uh, you have more privacy, and you have have rooms of your own. Some have dormitories, and the food is good. Is yes, it really good? Yes, it's really good. If you get pancakes, and you know that's something good. Maryland health officials have drawn up plans and are now implementing a different concept to treat the retarded. The idea is to return as many of them as possible to their homes or the community to have the state help parents to keep their retarded child home as long as possible. This, officials say, helps everyone to see the retarded differently. To see them as people who can contribute positively to society, a society which seems to place its highest value on usefulness. Retardation Director Bert Schmickel is starting a system which enables a specialist to visit the parents as soon as a retarded baby is born. This to advise them of care and counseling available. The new plan also combines daycare centers, foster homes, and smaller institutions. Henryton Hospital for Retarded Adults is 12 miles from Rosewood, but a world away in lifestyle. 391 men and women live here. Most of them used to exist, or in reality, vegetated Rosewood. Nearly all of them came from Rosewood's quadrangle, and half from King and Pembroke cottages. They are toilet trained, eat with knives and forks, productive, and apparently happy. This is what happened. They moved here into uncrowded rooms and were taught basic living skills. They were called residents instead of the girls and boys. Everyone does something, from sewing quilts to sorting nails. Henryton residents work, and they get a dollar or so a week and lots of satisfaction. This, the staff feels, is a secret. Work, plan activity, and recreation sublimate tendencies toward mental diseases some retarded people have. 
residents who have banged walls or sat for hours and rocked and stared now turn out peace goods and art items for sale. Some didn't like it at first. They objected to having to get up in the mornings and diet if they were fat. But with the help of a buddy system, new arrivals learned to wear shoes and socks, make a bed, go to the clinic for medicine, and get used to an unlocked door. Henryton residents take tranquilizers, and many are the same type of hyperactive person who today fill filthy King Cottage at Rosewood. Some residents are even working outside the hospital. They learn how to clean and keep house and run appliances in a model home. 44 are out on the job, and another 25 are available for work as domestics or nursing home aides. They used to just sit or rock at Rosewood. But it is not all work at Henryton. There are dances, parties, and even card games. The average IQ is under 30. It's a life of dignity and satisfaction. But officials say it's still not the entire answer for Maryland's retarded. A large part of the answer is at Great Oaks School in Montgomery County. It is a Wallace residential and daycare center for the retarded residents of Montgomery and the four southern Maryland counties. Several others are planned across the state. The center staff trains a retarded child and counsels his parents. It offers specialized babysitting so the parents can take a vacation. Its main aim is to help the parent keep the child at home. Unlike Rosewood, which is run by doctors, an administrator is in charge at Great Oaks. He calls on Georgetown University for medical services and has only one doctor on his staff. A maintenance company cleans and repairs the building. He says, we hire the experts in their field. The teaching experts use a method called reinforcement to train the children. Every correct action is rewarded, and it works. Do this. Very good, Mitchell. Very good, Chucky. Good, Iris. Put your blocks on the table. Put your hands in your lap. So everybody looks at me. Oh, good. Everybody's looking. Everybody do this. Very good, Chucky and Karen, Mitchell. Good, Iris. Very good. Chucky, you want to watch me? Karen? Watch me. Everybody look. Do this. Pick up one block. No. Good, no. Richard. Karen, pick it up and put it in the air. That's it. Karen. Very good. Good, all right. Great Oaks brings the people from the community inside. Volunteer foster grandparents get transportation and lunch. They come every weekday from 8.30 to 1. Like Rosewood and Henryton, parents are assessed what they can afford for services at Great Oaks. Only patients under 12 are admitted now, but the program will expand in the future. 97 patients from Rosewood have been transferred here already. The staff aim is to treat the child with dignity. We'll get lunch ready. Uh, Steve? Up here. Take your hand and put it where you want it. Mm -hmm. Give me a kiss. Ah. Foster grandparents rarely miss a day. The Great Oaks director isn't sure who benefits the most from the program, grandparent or grandchild. In order to reinforce the tie with the community, as soon as the children are ready, they are sent to public schools. Great Oaks opened last year, and five children who lived there were ready to attend special classes in Prince George's and Montgomery counties this September. you have anything you want to show us? This was from... Oh, what did you learn about fire prevention? Oh, we learned that... Uh, that... We're uh, supposed to stay inside. I mean, go outside when there's fires. So that's good. The parents of some of the children who live here take them home weekends. During parent counseling sessions, they are told what the child is being taught in school and how to keep up the learning process at home. The parents also tell the counselors what they think their child needs to know to be a successful part of the family. As good as Great Oaks is, 
there are still thousands more retarded not being helped in the area it serves. So retardation director Schmickel wants to set up more daycare facilities, like the Providence Center near Annapolis. This would keep retarded children at home, where Schmickel says most of them must ultimately be, if the potential of a retarded child is to be realized. students work as well as play. Some leave the school to clean churches or ready new homes after the builder is finished. Others work in a greenhouse to stock a mobile flower shop on the docks of Annapolis. Don't pack it too tight, Jeff. That's good. Turn him upside down, Lewis, and give him a good whack. The first minute, oh. Okay, wait, we've got to put some dirt in here first. Providence director Patricia Hudson says Providence was opened 10 years ago by parents and county officials who were distressed because there was no place except Rosewood for their children. The students concentrate on useful things so they can help out at home and have better body control. There still are a number of children and adults living at Rosewood who could go to daycare centers like this, but they have no families, or their families can't or won't take them. Others, however, have found great satisfaction in raising retarded foster children. Well, they do have their ways to show an appreciation because everything that you do for the little one, he, it's thank you. And uh, Jimmy and, and uh, Herbie, I know at least once a day, possibly twice a day, they're always saying, I'm a good mother. And when they show their appreciation, uh, I think it means a lot to us. It's just a wonderful life. I've been raised around a large family, and everything went along nicely. And it's just a wonderful feeling, that's all i got to say. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ernest Smith live in Baltimore. He's an electrician for the B&O Railroad, and they have three teenage children of their own. The state pays them $110 a month, for each of their three foster children. Well, can you say a pledge to the flag? Yes. Well, let me hear you say it. Yeah. Yeah. Say it. Say it. Say it. Gracious to the flag. I'm gracious to the flag. I'm a thing. I'm a nation. Kirby is nine. He's been with the Smiths for two years. His natural parents visit occasionally. His IQ is below 50. Who comes to visit you once in a while? Andrea. Did Miss Kimmel come and see you? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. You like Miss Kimmel? Yes. She's a very nice lady, isn't she? Huh? Yeah. Where'd you go on your vacation this year? Jimmy is seven, a mongoloid, and he has the same 30 to 50 IQ as brothers do. He's been with us in this three and a half years, and his parents don't visit him. Aaron. Aaron. Yellow. Nothing. What's your favorite color? Blue. Blue. <laughs> Look, who's this? Aaron came to the Smith when he was just six months old. He's almost five now. He's a mongoloid, too, and his parents don't visit either. Who am I? About the... Look, who am I? They... <laughs> All of the boys placed here by Rosewood attend special schools. The two older ones in the regular school system, and little Aaron at a day center. The mother says her older children help her, 
But most of all, the three retarded boys have brought the family closer than ever. That's that mm-hmm. yeah. big car. Big car. Big car. Big car. Big car. Big car. Yeah. As I reported, what you have just seen was shown earlier this month on News for Washington. And as a result of these reports, no one was fired, although it is obvious that Mr. Schmickle would not mind if some Rosewood administrators resigned. A change from traditional and, in some cases, inadequate institutional care seems underway. Claire Crawford went again to Rosewood. Here is that report. Maryland Retardation Director Bert Schmickle stepped in and took personal supervision. He said Rosewood was one of the worst institutions he'd seen in more than 30 years of caring for the retarded. Next week, he plans to move 15 inmates from King and 20 more from an ancient building across a quadrangle into newer and cleaner rooms. He says he hopes to empty King Cottage completely as soon as possible. More than that, he says he's going to tear it down. And he says he's going to tear this down, too. This is the fence which isolates the Zell from the rest of Rosewood. The Zell itself will change, as will the rest of the quadrangle. It will no longer be a dumping ground. They've taken out the broken toilets, the ones that have been broken for three to six years, depending on who you ask. So now the inmates can use the basketball court. The hole in the roof isn't fixed completely yet, but a contract to do that has been let. Mr. Schmickle has ambitious plans for quadrangle inmates, the people who remain here will be in smaller groups and repaired buildings with rugs on the floor and personal possessions. They will truly be patients instead of inmates. He thinks it will take a year to 18 months to do it. I believe firmly that uh, we should plan and program for the retarded exactly as we plan for the normal person. Everything we do should have and keep this thought in mind. Uh, when we talk about normalization, and if we really believe it, and uh, it's, it's part of us, then we couldn't do the dehumanizing things. We couldn't live with the dehumanizing kind of things that are taking place uh, here now in, in uh, some areas. It, and I do not make any exceptions. Uh, in other words, the profoundly retarded we should approach in the same way as we should the mildly retarded. And we should look at them in terms of, of developing them to their fullest potential uh, within normal uh, settings. What do you think went wrong here at Rosewood, say, at King Cottage? Well, I think size and numbers is very detrimental toward, a, toward approaching any kind of a training uh, child-centered program. It's, it's impossible. And uh, the larger uh, an institution gets, uh, the more crowded a, a particular cottage gets, the less and less individual the individual is noticed. Uh, uh, as I've said so many times, in a large institution, the administrative concerns become greater than the concern for the individual. And I think the average person who sees what is going on here will almost volunteer, as you said now, what, what can we do? We can, uh, we can set up our own foster grandparent programs. We do not necessarily have to have federal assistance, but we can take middle-aged and older people who can give us a few hours a day and sign them to one or two people per week on an individual basis. And uh, I'm sure this alone will bring, uh, for the first time, some personal attention to many of these uh, people that you see. What do you think the future of large institutions like Rosewood is? Well, as far as I'm concerned, they should be out of business, uh, particularly in the uh, care of the mildly and moderately retarded. I think we need backup institutions uh, for those with serious medical problems, uh, unusual uh, behavioral or emotional uh, overlay in, uh, in, in, in behavior. And um, we should be moving towards small group home and individual homes scattered throughout the, the communities. And uh, with some small backup, uh, uh, such as we have with our Great Oak facility in the greater Washington area, and as we now have out to bid uh, for the Eastern Shore, other than those backup situations, we should be creating, that is, constructing or building homes or buying already existing homes in the center of communities where our, our retarded people can be part of their family life, part of their community life. But it will take political commitment for the changes that Schmickle wants. Immediately after these reports were aired, Maryland Governor Marvin Mandel called the series a rehash. He said that his administration was aware of the problems and had made tremendous progress in helping the retarded. 
Mandel's press secretary said the governor had received no reaction to the reports. Dr. Cook has said that one problem is that there is no outstanding political figure focusing personal attention on the problems of the retarded. Cook said that President Kennedy, who had a retarded sister, was attracting attention and research money to the handicapped before he was assassinated. That combination of political prestige and personal involvement is needed again, according to Dr. Cook. Two state legislators saw the Rosewood reports and said the situation illustrated a basic political problem. There are in excess of 120,000 mentally retarded in the state of Maryland. Eighty percent of these, according to national statistics, can be rehabilitated and made tax-paying citizens. Now, aside from the humanity that's involved in doing this, and that is in developing a person's abilities to the greatest extent for him and for the benefit of society, there's an economic factor involved. A substantial amount of money spent now would save us millions and billions in the future. And that all we've been doing over these many years, in many cases, is throwing millions of dollars down the drain. Nobody can tell me that budgets are all that important. It's about time we humanized our budgets. Uh, I was just talking to uh, one of our cabinet, new cabinet members, who told me that he's beginning to see now that budget seems to control everybody's thinking. And he's a little shocked. I won't mention his name, but he's a person who's well-versed from the other side of the fence. Now, budgets aren't the predominating thing here. A human factor is what should be predominating in our budget thinking. Tremendous inertia in our society. And I think one of the ways of breaking up this inertia of big buildings, big bureaucracy, is to put the hands, uh, put the money for the care of uh, these children in the hands of the parents and let them purchase care. I've described this as the free choice principle, uh, allowing uh, Social Security, for example, to make payments directly to the family uh, for them then to purchase. Uh, care uh, in uh, non-profit institutions or for that matter even profit institutions uh, so that the families have some alternative than simply the state institution. This wouldn't cost society anymore because there's an enormous amount of money relatively going into these big facilities that uh, pay a whole hierarchy of salaries. The number of doctors at Rosewood, for example, grossly in excess of what's needed for the medical care and uh, those salaries take up a good deal of money and the supervisor of the supervisor costs a good deal and I think smaller facilities really can end up to be less expensive there is a feeling amongst uh, administrators that if something's very big it's cheaper but I think the evidence is heavily in the other direction Dr. Cook, who is also the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation, says the retarded have more than financial and political problems. They must combat society's fickle attitude. Throughout history, Dr. Cook says, the retarded have been alternately scorned and revered. They have been left to die. They have served as court jesters or worshipped as if carrying special messages from a deity. And they have been relegated to institutions. He says today in America there are special pressures working against the acceptance of a person with low intelligence. I think it's a reflection of uh, our rather great hopes in our society that everyone's going to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, why, it's very easy to be rejected. We see this now with the new programs for abortion of the uh, handicapped. Uh, the mongoloid baby or someone else and uh, those programs uh, move more and more towards uh, eliminating defects which uh, I think a generation ago were tolerated now some of the defects are very severe and I think that uh, this may be justified in some instances but what concerns me is that uh, our hope for a kind of perfect society means that our expectations for our children are very unreal and if a child doesn't come up to expectations then he may be rejected by his parents and this is very destructive to uh, any individual it does uh, go along with the belief that everyone in america should be very productive and that we ought to turn out an increasingly large gross national product and 
to be of service to people, to take care of individuals that aren't perfect, seems to be rather low on our scale of values. And it influences the care of the retarded. It influences what we do in hospitals and everything else, that we don't have the brightest and the most willing and the most exceptional young people going into some of these fields because in our society it produces the most important thing. Can this uh, care of the retarded or this rejection of the retarded be linked to other problems in society like the way people are treated in prisons and mental institutions? Oh, I think this is all part of an orientation of society to uh, reject the imperfect and to uh, put our emphasis on uh, on production rather than service. Trying to improve a human being seems to be less important than improving an automobile. And I think that's a sad commentary.